Well, as we've seen so far in Philippians, the Apostle Paul is in a great conflict. He's in prison. And they can keep him in prison as long as they want. Not only that, there are conflicts that he has to endure. There are actually people who want to aggravate him, discourage him, irritate him, and make it worse for him while he's in prison. And these guys call themselves Christians. So can you imagine, in the midst of being in prison, open-ended, and conflict from guys who are trying to tear him down, he's writing a letter of encouragement to an entire church. And what he's demonstrating is that he is living a life worthy of the gospel. He's not afraid of anybody. He's not afraid to die. And if he lives, that means he's going to be bearing fruit for Jesus. His goal, whether he lives or dies, is to glorify Jesus for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. Now, the church that he's writing to, he says, you're going through the same conflict that you heard in me, saw in me. You're going through it. And his concern for them is that they also live lives worthy of the gospel. And this morning, what the scriptures we're going to look at are talking about how do you do that practically? It's great to say, I want to live a life worthy of the gospel. Okay, what do you want to do? Uh, it's not a very good answer, is it? So we're going to look at practically what it means to live a life worthy of the gospel, which means the result is going to look like Paul. Encouraged. Not afraid of anything. Bearing fruit no matter what. It means, really, nothing in life gets you down, but you know what you're about. That's the kind of life that Paul wants these people in the church in Philippi to live like that. That's the way God wants us to live. So I think it's amazing. These are glorious scriptures. And I'm so thankful that we get to look at them today. Me, I'm happy. Let's read them. Chapter 2. It says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Now that's a funny way to start off, isn't it? Therefore, okay? Whenever you see the word therefore in the Bible, it means whoever is writing is going to make a conclusion. It's going to make some kind of a point based on what he's already said. All right? So here's Paul making a conclusion. And then he says this. If there's any consolation in Christ, isn't that funny? And I looked up the word any, just because I'll look up anything in my dictionary. And the word, can you define any? Those of you that are smirking right now. See, you can't either. So I said, what, what does any mean? And it means an indeterminate amount. It just means, is it there or not? So what basically Paul is saying is, what is Christ like? What is he like? What is in him? What is it? Who is he? And he says, if there's any consolation in Christ, consolation, 
Some of your margins will have the word encouragement. And it's the Greek word that you might have heard before, parakaleo, or paraklesis is the noun form. And that's a word that applies to the Holy Spirit. He's the comforter, or you could say encourager. And there's this idea of encouragement, strengthening, giving hope and strength inwardly. The kind of encouragement that maybe your parents give you to not quit, not give up. I do that for my girls. There'll be times when one of them is just limp, discouraged. She's kind of this picture of totally boneless, devastated, can't keep going. And I say, babe, you can do this. You can do this. You're not terrible. You're great. Now stop this. Now, did you notice what you can do when you're a parent? You can get in there and say something really tender and sweet, and then you can put a little oomph in it right at the end. Now stop this. You don't yell at her and just say, what are you doing? I love you. Now stop that. Doesn't go over very well, does it? But you get in there and say, no, you're not useless. You can do this. It's just a roadblock. You're bigger. You can get over this. You can do it. Now do it. Quit messing around. That's what this word covers. It covers everything from the very slightest, oh, you can do it, right up to, come on. Quit wallowing in self-pity and move ahead. And the whole point is to give strength Comfort, encouragement. And Paul says, is there any of that in Jesus? Is that a great question to ask? Almost up there like, where do you get your encouragement? Let's do it. They call that strength in a bottle. Well, he says, is there any in Christ? What's he like? Any reason of for hope in Jesus? Well, let's see. When I didn't care about God or anything, he died for my sins so I wouldn't go to hell. Is that encouraging? And then he rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven so that where he is, I can be also. He is the absolute proof that I'm going to get there. Is that encouraging? And then I think, well, I've been discouraged so many times. I'm like the 2016 poster child for discouragement. Help Robbie and thousands like him. Give to the discouragement fund. And I've tried to quit so many times, and Jesus won't let me. And he does the same thing that I do to my kids. Ah, oh, come on. I love you. Now quit wallowing and keep going. He does the same thing. He won't let me quit. He's very encouraging. Sometimes he'll say to me, so, I'm raised from the dead. You're not going to go to hell. I'm going to keep you forever. And you're, you're worried about the money? Is that it? Like, I made billions of universes and I can't take care of you? Is that what your big problem is? How many times have we done this before? Over the last 26 years. Come on. He's encouraging. Have you ever found that to be true? Have you ever found that Jesus himself is encouraging you? Never? Is everybody dead? How many people have been encouraged by Jesus? Come on. All right. Thank you. You may put your hands down. Is there any consolation in Christ? Yes, I would say buckets of consolation, encouragement. All right, what's the next thing he says? If any comfort of love. Now, this is the comfort produced by love. And again, it's this strengthening and this giving of hope that comes from the fact that Jesus loves you. I want to ask again, have you ever experienced 
Jesus loving you. I want to see hands. Come on. So you have personally experienced the fact that Jesus loves you. Isn't that amazing? Now, let me ask a question. When have you experienced that? I will bet you 5P that you have experienced it right when you thought you are the least worthy of it. And you would say, if I were Jesus, I would go... And as I was swirling down the bowl, I would say, you're doing the universe a favor. Bye. I would do that, but he doesn't do that, does he? Right when you're down on the floor and you failed him and you've messed up so bad, you can never see the sky again, he says, come here, I love you. And you almost can't stand it because he's so good to you. And you try to figure out, how can he be this good to me? And then you decide, oh, heck, I might as well enjoy it. Quit trying to figure it out. He's smarter than me. It's his problem. And he just, he, he just loves you. Is there any comfort of love in Christ? Oh, yes. Huge amounts of that. And then he goes on to say, if any fellowship of the Spirit. Now, fellowship here is kind of a weak word. You know what it means? It means to share everything. If you have fellowship, this kind of fellowship with somebody, it means you have everything in common. The best way I ever heard it described was you get this big pot and you put everything you've got into it and then you jump into it and then Jesus puts everything he has into it and then he jumps in. And then you share what's in the pot. And he's got everything. And what do you put in? Well, all my liabilities, my failures, my weaknesses, and my sins. I had a couple of good thoughts, but they died of loneliness. So you just jump in, and then you get to share everything with Jesus. He shares all his good stuff with you, and you share all your bad stuff with him. Is that fair? But that's what happens. Now, this is with the Holy Spirit, notice. And the Holy Spirit is given to us so that we can know the things given to us freely by God. And it works like this. You don't know what I'm thinking, do you? And I'm glad, because there's some stuff that I've thought, I don't want you to know. But if you were in my head, I couldn't stop you from knowing everything about me that I know, right? I couldn't even stop you. Like, no, don't go there. It'd be too late. Well, here's what God has given us. His spirit, so that we can really know him. That we know that the thoughts that he has toward us are really good. We can know exactly what he thinks. That's what he's done. He's shared his spirit with us. Now, comfort. Comfort, I want to mention, means giving hope and strength. And you know how Jesus gives us comfort is by the truth. Some people will comfort you and say, there, there, dear, it'll be okay. You say, no, it won't. Quit patting my hand. That's nothing. In other words, the comfort's got to be real, doesn't it? And that's what Jesus gives us. That's what he shares with us, with his spirit. Real comfort, because what he has to share is really true. Now, a scripture I wanted to especially read is in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 16, listen to this and think about it. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Everlasting consolation. 
That means that strengthening and encouraging will outlast all of your problems because all your problems are only temporary. As bad as it gets, it's only temporary. But everlasting consolation is going to outlast everything. We're going to look back on all this and laugh. Do you get it? Now, grace. I want to tell you what grace is. Because he gives us everlasting consolation by grace. We were doing a Bible study in, in South Hall. And what we were looking at is the first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we had to think about, what is it to be poor in spirit? We thought, well, what is it to be rich in spirit? And we thought of that list of the fruit of the spirit in in Galatians chapter 5. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, goodness, faithfulness, and there's more. All right. And we thought, okay, if you're poor in that, that means no love, no joy, no peace, no goodness, no faithfulness, no self-control. What does that make you? And somebody said, a bad person. I said, yeah. What do you know? No goodness? That means you're a bad person. And then we came to this thing that really blew our minds. How does somebody who is not qualified to go to heaven end up owning heaven? He says, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you're not qualified to go there, how would you end up owning heaven? And the answer we came to is, somebody has to give it to you as a gift. That's what grace means. It should blow your fuses that you are actually going to go to heaven. You're not qualified to go there. They stop you at the door. They say, do you have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, goodness, meekness? You say, nope. What makes you think you're going to get in here? It's mine. Somebody gave it to me as a gift. Oh, say no more. Come right in. That should blow your mind. That's what grace is. I'm not qualified but it's mine. That's what the gospel is. So look what he's given us. Everlasting consolation and good hope by grace. Do I deserve it? Heck no. Can I receive it as a gift? Oh, yeah. That's what's going on here. Comfort of love, fellowship of the spirit. And then he says, if any affection and mercy... Affection and mercy. I like those. You know what affection means? It means you're attached to somebody. And I like that too. You know, when you have a relationship, there are bonds, ties. They're invisible. You can't see them. But they're there and they're real. And I experienced that in a tremendous way yesterday. Because there I was, dropping Joni off at the hospital for this procedure where they're going to put her out, you know, and go in with laparoscopy and do this and that and the other thing. And, oh, she'll be out by noon. Oh, yeah, Rob, just pick me up, you know, later. I said, no, I'm not going anywhere. I can't. I don't care if I pay the mother of all parking bills. I don't care how much it costs. I'm not going anywhere. I couldn't go. I'm not saying that I'm anybody, but I just found, don't make me go away. I can't. You are the most precious person in the world to me, and I can't go away. Now, I even surprised myself how strongly I feel about that, but that's the way I feel about her. So I'm just saying there is an attachment there that I don't want to break. And see, is there any affection, attachment to you 
in Jesus? Yes, there is. More than he values his own life, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friend. So he has an unbelievable attachment to you that he will not and cannot erase. And then compassion. Is there any, any mercy in Jesus? Another translation will have compassion, and it's referring to, one, the ability to feel somebody else's pain, and then two, the desire to do something about it. A lot of people can get to the first one, sympathy. Oh, I feel your pain, man. But they don't do anything about it. Real compassion means I feel that like it was me going through that and I am going to do something about it right now. Is there any compassion in Jesus? So much compassion that he would come down from being God to being practically nothing like us and die in our place. That's doing something pretty practical about it. That one isn't go in peace and be warmed and be filled. He died in our place. So is there any consolation in Christ? Is there any comfort of love in Jesus? Is there any fellowship of the Spirit in Jesus? Is there any affection? Is there any compassion in Jesus? And when you think about it, it overwhelms you. He is all these things. All right. Then Paul goes on and says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. Now, when he says fulfill my joy, that's what he wants to see happen in these people's lives. If they do what he says for them to do, he is going to be unbelievably happy. He says, there won't be any room left for anything else in my happiness if I see you living like this. I will be so happy. I'll be that short of exploding. Fulfill my joy. It's not just Paul's joy. It's God's joy. This is what he wants. It's in 3 John, uh, verse 4, where John writes, I have no greater joy than this, than to see my children walking in truth. No parent likes to see their kids living badly. I have a friend in Seattle whose kids are living badly. One of them just got arrested the second time for shoplifting. And the lawyer said, after this, don't come to my office anymore because I don't deal with repeat offenders. Isn't that a hard thing to hear? That says, if you take your life so lightly, I want nothing to do with you. And this person is going to find out, everybody in the world is going to treat them like that. So, you think shoplifting is funny, do you? Well, stay away from me. She's going to have a hard time getting a job with a, with a criminal record. Now, what parent enjoys seeing their children live like that? Kid, what did I bring you up for? Why did I change your diapers? Why have I slaved and struggled over you so that you could live like a complete numpty? So Paul says, fulfill my joy. And God is saying, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. Like-minded. This is the most amazing thing in the world to think about. We're all going to think the same way. Have you ever seen that happen anywhere? Have you ever seen that happen in your family? 
Have you seen that happen at your business? In your country? Does anybody think the same way? Now, you know, we've all thought in the back of our mind, you know, if everybody just thought like me, this world would be straightened out. Everybody who's laughing right now has thought that. It just seems so reasonable to me, and you are so unreasonable. If you thought like me, you'd be smart and reasonable. But you know, if we all thought like one person here on the planet, this would be hell. Because all of us are completely lopsided and weird. We go around saying, that guy is quirky, that guy is quirky, he's eccentric. Well, it takes one to know one, doesn't it? We're all a little bit... And you're laughing right there in the front row, man. He knows the awful truth. You know what Paul wants us to think like? is like Jesus. And that's possible. In fact, it's not only possible, it's necessary. Because it turns out there's only two ways to think in the entire universe. There's only two ways to think in the universe. And they're right here. It says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. That's the first way to think. In the whole universe, selfish ambition and conceit, that way was thought up by one of God's angels who decided, why should he be God? I'm pretty magnificent myself. Why don't I have the job? And then everybody will bow down to me. That's what being God is all about. Woo-hoo, I could get into that. I could be like bigger than Lady Gaga. I could be like God. I could have more Twitter followers. Then I'd be somebody. So this angel decides, I will. I will be like the Most High. I'm going to set my throne above everybody else's. I want everybody to worship me. I think that's a fun idea. Okay, that's one way to think. That's called ambition and conceit. It's called conceit because you think you're really cool, but you're not. You are deceived. That's what conceit means. You think you're better than you really are. The other only way there is to think in the whole universe is lowliness of mind. You say, I don't know. I don't like that. <laughs> sounds like somebody might get hurt. doesn't sound very clean. It sounds like you're down there with the doormat. It doesn't sound like a very nice existence at all. Why would I want to think lowly? Is that right down there with toe scum? and gross things, and, oh, here comes somebody. He's lowly. Watch out, you know. Oh, here I am, you know. Not very much. It just sounds despicable, doesn't it? Of course, here's who thinks like that. God. And so we have to sort of change our minds about what's lowly. See, here's God, almighty, <coughs> everywhere at once, all power, knows everything, what is God really like? The answer, he doesn't think a lot about himself. In fact, all of eternity, who does he think about? The son. He loves the son. He's not focused on himself. Who does the son love? He loves the father. How do they love? Through the spirit. Here's God not focused on himself. He's always thinking about somebody else. That's why love can be eternal. So when God creates, 
Who's he thinking about? Himself? See, everybody's thinking, oh, God created everything so that he could have everybody bow down and worship him. How crude is that? That isn't God. That's every other God. The true living God created because he wants everybody to be happy. He wants to overflow in love to others. But he's perfectly happy without us. He is the eternally blessed God. He didn't create us because, I don't know, I'm bored. What do I do? I know. I'll make a bunch of living Legos. That'll be fun. We'll just build things and do all kind of stuff and knock them down. And that'll be fun. Yeah, it'll keep us occupied for thousands of years. Then we'll do something else. He doesn't need us. He wants to pour out his love. That's why he made us. So <coughs> lowliness of mind. That's how God thinks. And then the other way to think is selfish ambition and conceit. I want to be the best. I want to be the top. I'm going to climb on everybody's head. I'm going to take care of number one. That's the devil. And here's what Paul is saying. Here's how you know if you're doing what Paul says. Being of one accord, one mind. Whose mind? Jesus' mind. And it's going to show in this. Doing nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. So everything you do, look at the motive for it. Why are you doing this? Why do you do what you do? Why do you serve in the church? Why do you work at your job? Why do you get married? Why do you parent? Why do you shop for groceries? Well, selfish ambition or conceit or lowliness of mind. Everything you do. Now, it says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. That means you go around and you say, you know what? You're better than me. I'm going to esteem you better than me. I knew this would happen. I have a solution. Uh, that, does, that doesn't mean <clears throat> that you go around and say, you're fabulous and I'm nothing. It doesn't mean like you have to beat yourself down to lift somebody else up. It just means you esteem others better than yourself. It doesn't even mean that you have to believe that everybody is better than yourself. It just means esteem them that way. So the big conflict in our minds, <clears throat> I'm getting froggy again. The big conflict in our minds is, you know what, these other people are not better than me. So why should I esteem them better? Well, here's the mind of Christ. He esteemed everybody better than himself, and he's better than everybody. Did you get that? Nobody here is going to say, oh, no, I'm better than Jesus. That would be insanity. But see, he went and said, they're all better than me. I'm going to esteem them better than myself. That's how come we get to be saved. And here's the challenge of Paul. If the Holy Spirit lives in you, you can do this. Humanly speaking, it's impossible and it can't work. But if Jesus is living in you, you can do it and you must do it. Because that's the way he thinks. Isn't that amazing? It's revolutionary. And it's fabulous when everybody starts doing that. So not only is it going to result in Paul having joy and in God having joy, but in people having joy. Can you imagine 
getting this sense from somebody that they think you're fabulous, what does that make you do? It sort of makes you like them back, doesn't it? What happens if you get the message from somebody, very subtle, but you get the message, you know, you're a dip. I despise you. None of your ideas are very smart. And you're basically an ineffectual failure. What happens if you begin to get that sort of whiff, that, that cold breeze from somebody? What does it make you feel like? Well, look at you. You know, and then you have a whole conflict wherever you're at. What's your problem? Well, he thinks I'm nothing. You know what? I think he's nothing. So great, we have two people walking around thinking the, each other is nothing. Is that pleasant? Especially when it's in a family. Paul says, nope, not in this family. He says, let everybody esteem one another better than themselves. That's how we operate. So everybody you look at, you say, you know what? I'm going to esteem you better than myself. One thing to do is to look for those things that they do better than you and make a lot of it. I can see everybody's failures. I have x-ray vision. I can see under armor and pretenses, and I can see everybody's problems and, and mistakes. But you know what we don't look for is what everybody's doing right and better. You know, I've come to the point where I realize most people are much better than me. And I can say that without exaggeration. I've seen what a failure I am. And it makes me marvel at people that can do things that I can't do. The list of things that I can't do is very long. And I marvel. And it makes it easy for me to see all those things in people that just, I can't do that. That's so amazing. How in the world do you do that? But that's what Jesus does. He does that with us. Have you noticed? He looks for the things in us that are good and he says, yeah, do that more. He never steps on our failures. It makes us feel crummy about our inabilities. So he says, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And this is a fascinating way to think, is to say, you know what? I'm okay. I'm going to make it to heaven, no sweat. Jesus gave it to me. But what about somebody else? Are they going to make it? How are they doing? I'm all squared away. Are they going to make it? How come they're not going to make it? What can I do about it so that they can make it? That's what he's talking about. Look out for the interests of others. Why are you failing? What are you missing? What can I give you that would help you get where you need to be? And here's the idea behind it. Your victory is my victory. When you get everything you need, then my victory is complete. You know, that's exactly what Paul is saying. Fulfill my joy. Why? Because you guys would be living fabulous and I would be so happy if you were. So here's the rule of being a Christian. Your victory is my victory. What can I do to get you there? What can I do? What do you need that I can give that would get you there? Because when you get there, I get there. And so that's completely opposite from the devil, isn't it? As long as I'm at the top... I can step on everybody at the bottom and I don't care. Woohoo! The only one that counts is me. But when God thinks, He says, when you get there, I get there. When you're glorified, I'm glorified. When you're lifted up and exalted, so am I. Isn't that fabulous? In the devil's way of thinking, everybody loses, even the devil. In God's way of thinking, everybody wins. There's nothing so fabulous as living together in love. That's what Paul wants for the Philippians. That's what he wants for us. Now, this is not poetry. This is reality. And the problem is, it's not automatic. It's 
Every single person saying to Jesus, I want you to live in me by your spirit and enable me to think the way you do. What can happen in a church is that somebody says, I don't want to think like that. And by default, they start thinking like the devil. It's about me. Why does that person tick me off? What's the problem over there? What's this? I don't like this. And what happens is we can quench the spirit. We can grieve the Holy Spirit. And see, this is a situation that's probably happening, happening in the church right here in Philippi because there's two ladies having a problem. You think, well, what's so bad about that? Well, see, here's two people that have lost the plot. And it doesn't take many. But if one person or two people got this conflict, it's no longer about the mind of Christ. It's about, you know what? You tick me off. You're such a dip. Get out of here. All of a sudden, there's the Holy Spirit being quenched and grieved. Is this love? Is this lowliness of mind? Is this the way Jesus talks? Does Jesus ever condemn somebody? <laughs> Remember when he could have? Moses says that such should be stoned. What do you say? Caught in the very act of adultery. Okay, let the one who is without sin cast the first stone. Oh, yeah. Where are your condemners, women? They've all left. Well, I don't condemn you either. See, he could have. So you know what? We have no right to throw stones. But we have a responsibility to be filled with the Spirit. This is another thing. Being filled with the Spirit doesn't mean you get tingly and you jump off the floor. Being filled with the Spirit means that you think like Jesus thinks. And that you're motivated to do what Jesus does. It's not a tingly experience that you go, wow, that was fabulous, let's do it again. The purpose is so that we are filled with the mind of Christ so that we love with that compassion of Christ. As we take communion this morning, let's be thinking about that. Any place where we have grieved the Spirit, where we've had selfish ambition, conceit, we just say, no, don't want to live like that. Don't want to hurt people. Instead, you search my heart, Lord, and see if there be any wicked way in me where I might be quenching the Spirit, me grieving the Spirit. If there's any place like that, then please show it to me and please wash me and cleanse me. And see, he'll do that. He will be happy to show us where we're going off so that he can bring us back. And then we're not quenching the spirit. We're not grieving him. He's pleased to pour out his fullness on us. That's going to fill us up and that's going to overflow to other people. That's what a church does. Everybody understand? Good. Then let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for this wonderful life with Jesus where he really does live in us and we really start to think different. Thank you, Lord, that you show us where we are being selfish, and especially at another's expense. And instead, you lead us to humble ourselves
and to ask forgiveness. Thank you that there is forgiveness. When we have ignored your spirit, when we have just gone ahead and thought, if everybody thought like me, this world would be a great place. I have thought like that many times and I've hurt many people and I'm so sorry. We thank you that we can receive you and that you're going to work out your salvation in us for good. Thank you for that. But as we receive the emblems and as we hold on to them, Lord, help us to search our hearts. You search us. You show us and then cleanse us. Make us people after your own heart. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. For I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind. 